I live in Chattanooga, in Tennessee. Every year we go to this music festival called Riverbend on the Tennessee River. The end of the festival is celebrated with one of the biggest fireworks shows in the world. It is hell to get into, or close to the festival on the last day. It's like everyone on the southeast of the United States wants to come and see these fireworks. My best friend, Tara, and I wanted to go find a vantage point that would overlook the river and watch the fireworks. We drove up to this ridge near the river and pulled up onto this gravel parking lot where we found multiple other people that had the same idea as us. Some trees were in the way, and we did notice a trail that went down the ridge. We walked about 40 yards down the trail and came to this camping clearing where we could see this river perfectly. We were talking and waiting for all these fireworks to start when we started to hear something rustling down in the trail. I thought I saw a silhouette of a person move between the trees on down the ridge. Tara had a small keychain flashlight, and she took it out and shined it down the trail. We didn't see anything. We kept hearing rustling and kept seeing nothing. We finally started thinking in our heads that it was just a noise of a squirrel or something. The fireworks started and had been going on for a few minutes when I heard a stick break right behind me. We turned around and looked but couldn't see anything. Tara turned her light, and there was a man standing literally five feet away from me. It was so dark that we couldn't even see him until that light was right on him. It was like a horror movie scene. We immediately started heading up the trail, and the whole way up, he was talking, saying things like, Where are you going? What's your name? What are two pretty things like you doing here? We ignored him and kept walking. Then he started getting angry and saying, Are you listening? You get back here. You know, nobody could hear you scream over these fireworks. And I have a knife. You don't even know my name. Nobody will ever catch me if I hurt you. We started running. And we got to the top of the hill where there were two kids that were playing, and I saw the dad standing further back. I told the kids that their dad wanted them, so they would get close to their dad and stay safe away from this creepy guy. I then walked over to their dad and told him about this man that followed us out of the trail, and asked if he cared if we just stood with him until this man was gone. He said of course, and thanked us for sending his kids in his direction. The man stood at the beginning of the trail and watched us for a long while, then finally went back into the woods. He had been watching us in the woods for at least 20 minutes before he approached us. He waited until the noise of the fireworks began, before he came out. It was September in central Idaho. Autumn had come down to the mountains, and with it, bow hunters looking for mountain goats. My cousin, let's call him Vern for anonymity's sake, is an avid hunter. He's been all over North America hunting various game. Bears in Alaska, wild hogs in Texas, bighorn sheep in Wyoming. But his favorite hunting area was the Lemhi Mountain Range in central Idaho. Our extended family has been hunting in those mountains for generations. We know every river bottom and mountain peak, like many people know their own neighborhoods. Mountain goats are a fascinating animal to hunt. They live well above the tree line in rocky environments. They are sure-footed and can climb near vertical slopes. Hunting these animals requires one to venture into these dangerous areas. You have to be mindful when you pursue an animal like that. One wrong step on a rocky slope or one loose rock could mean you're not going home ever again. Vern was an expert mountain hunter. It's something he was born to do. Vern decided to hunt in the Hayden River area of the Lemhis. It's a very familiar spot to most locals, and the area is home to plenty of mountain goats. 
The first mile of Vern's hike was uneventful as he climbed up the canyon. The air was crisp, and his breath formed like great plumes as he progressed. The sun was just peeking over the mountains when Vern came to a small deer trail. He decided it might be a nice shortcut from his usual route, and took it. A few hundred feet up the trail, he saw something odd pop out from behind a tree. It was a man. He was dressed in a light denim coat and jeans, and was carrying a small backpack. My cousin stopped for a second to get his bearings, unsure of where this guy came from. The man waved to him with both arms. One of them was holding an older-style hunting bow. Acknowledging him, Vern waved back. Although the man looked to be physically fine, it was clear that he was emotionally distressed. He yelled out something my cousin couldn't quite hear and waved his arm, indicating my cousin should follow him. Vern didn't get any bad vibes from this man and could tell that he was genuinely in need of some kind of help. He began to make his way up the canyon, following the mystery man. Vern could never gain any ground on this guy. He was always just far enough away that he couldn't talk to him. Periodically, the man would stop, turn toward him, and make sure Vern was still following. Every time he looked back, Vern could see the worry in his face. My cousin did his best to remain calm and keep a smile on his face, unsure who or what he was being led to. It was peculiar, Vern thought as he hiked. He hadn't seen any other vehicles on his drive up to the trailhead. Perhaps he came in over another ridge? What could he possibly be leading him to? He figured one of his hunting party had been hurt and needed help. Of course, he wouldn't have to speculate if the man would just stop and talk to him for five minutes. Vern lost sight of the guy just past a turn in the trail. The trail opened up into an incredibly steep, rocky talus slope. He looked in every direction and could not locate the man when he heard a whistle. Looking up, he saw the guy about 500 feet up the rocky slope, waving at him. There's no possible way he could have gotten up that far just in that short amount of time that Vern had lost sight of him. He still didn't feel any fear or weariness about this weird situation. The man was now waving more frantically, practically begging Vern to follow him up the slope. With a sigh and a grunt, he started up the rocks. It was slow going. Every other step caused a mini rock slide and would cause him to continuously lose his footing. Huffing and puffing on the cool, thin air, my cousin eventually made it up to a small landing. It had taken him almost 45 minutes to get to that spot where he saw the man from below. There was no earthly way anyone could have done that scramble up that hill any faster. Totally exhausted and out of breath, Vern sat down on the stone landing. He looked around and couldn't see the man anywhere. As he scanned his surroundings, he saw something odd poking out of a boulder about 20 feet away from him. Walking over to it, he found a weathered boot. Two boots, actually. Inside those boots, and under the boulder as well, were bones. Vern looked around once again for the man, but he never saw him again. Instead of feeling eerie or unnerving, Vern felt a sense of relief wash over him. These emotions weren't his own. What he felt seemed to come from all around him. He marked the spot with his GPS and decided to make his way down and call the authorities. The Lemhi County Sheriff's Office responded, and he led them all the way up to the canyon to the body. It took four grown men to push the boulder out of the way, and when they did, they found the skeletal remains of a man. On the body, they found hunting equipment and some personal effects. From a credit card in the wallet, they were able to identify the man. He was a bow hunter that had gone missing almost exactly 53 years beforehand. Vern never wanted to be identified to the public or the missing hunter's family. He didn't want recognition for something like that. To him, it was just one of those bizarre mountain stories. He was happy that the family got closure, even if it was half a century later. The only thing that bothered him was the man leading him up the canyon and with his strange and sudden disappearance. He had mentioned the waving man to the sheriff but brushed it off. 
when the news reports came out announcing the discovery, several photos of the man were published. Byrne was absolutely shocked when he saw them. In those photos was the man that he'd seen leading him up the mountain to that body. It all finally made sense to him. The man's distressed look. The constant checking if Vern was following him. The sense of relief he felt when the body was discovered. That man was desperate to get home. And through Vern, he was able to be reunited with his family. I was in college. Female, taking a course of outdoor survival. The course ended with a three-day, three-night, wilderness solo type of mission. We were allowed to take a backpack, empty canteen, sleeping bag, knife, six matches, rope, a sheet of plastic, a change of clothes, extra socks, halazone tablets, small cooking pot, and spoon. We were not allowed to bring any food or water, since part of our training was identifying edibles and finding a water source. Once I was dropped off, I had to hike in and find a spot to set up camp. First, I had to place a flag on a tree near my drop point so that I could be located in three days. I was loving life, just me and nature. I had no fears, even as night began to fall. I enjoyed the sound just from the woods all around me and didn't mind not having a tent. I built a small fire and had a great feeling of peace. I slept well that night, but woke up thirsty. My search for a water source began. Happily, I found a muddy stream, let the water settle in my pot, placed the tablets into the water, and boiled it for good measure. It was definitely a crappy taste, but at least I was hydrated. All went well, and I had a great time, until my last day. It was early afternoon on the last day and time to break camp. I cleaned up my camp area and hiked out to the drop spot. As I sat, leaning against this tree, I heard the sound of a vehicle off in the distance. I figured that it had been my pickup. As I waited, a vehicle that I had never seen before pulled up to the dirt path in front of me. Immediately, I realized that I did not know this man who was driving. He gave me an odd look, and my gut told me that he was bad news. He asked what I was doing there, and if I was alone. I said that my friends were behind me, breaking camp. He gave me a knowing look, got back in his vehicle, and rode off. I was terrified. I knew that I had to hide, and fast. I ran into the woods and hid. As I ran, I heard the same car come back. I stayed as quiet as I could possibly be and remained hidden. I heard him get out of the car. I could hear him calling me and walking through the bush, looking for me. I was honestly afraid. Eventually he gave up and I heard his car door slam and the engine start and the car pull away. Going back to my drop-off point was not an option anymore, so I began to hike through the woods, hoping I would find a base camp. After walking what felt like hours, I saw a forest ranger. I told him who I was and what had happened to me. He told me that I had done the right thing since a young woman had just been. The night before, and the police and the forest service had been searching the area. Happily, he drove me back to my base camp, where I learned that another girl in my class had an extremely creepy encounter with the same man the night before. She had scared him away by blowing a brass whistle until help arrived. If there is anything to be learned from this, it is being sure to always trust your gut feeling and never camp alone. First off, I would like to remind everybody, whoever is reading this, if you are, that all of these stories are 100% true and have happened to me personally, so there is no lying here. 
Also, I don't know why, but I feel almost compelled to tell my experiences, and I hope someone can relate, or maybe just get a kick out of them. I have had run-ins with skinwalkers. Yes, skinwalkers, on three separate occasions. Let me tell you, they are not easy to talk about, let alone write about, because just thinking about it gets me scared again. So I will tell you about the first time I ever saw one which happened to be the first time I ever heard of one. First off, a little bit of background about me. I live in Utah, and all of these experiences happened while I was still living with my parents. I grew up about an hour outside of Salt Lake City, in a farming country, so I was raised on a farm. Growing up, I used to go hunting with my dad and my brother four plus times a year. So between hunting, camping, and growing up on a farm, I know my animals. Now to start the story. It was seven years ago in late October. I was 18 years old and my boyfriend, now husband, was 21. For the sake of being private, we will call him Rob and he is half Spanish and half Irish. One thing to note about Rob is he is a pretty big boy. Six feet tall, about 260 pounds, football star. He lived all the way in Salt Lake City but he would still drive up here every day after we both got off work to see me. He was a trooper. Well, one night he wasn't feeling too good, so he decided to take off a little earlier at 3 a.m. We walked out my back door to the front of the house where his car was parked. The moment we walked out the back door, the smell consumed us. It smelled like rotted meat. Rob commented that the country air stunk more than usual. I remember thinking that maybe a cow had died earlier in the day, and we didn't know, but it smelled like it had been decomposing for weeks. When we got to his car, Rob threw his stuff in quick and got back out to give me one last hug goodbye, when something caught my eye. It looked like a skinny, bony dog. I could barely walk. I remember thinking maybe it was a stray, and I was going to shoo it away, but the way its body was shaped, it made me think that it was maybe some sort of coyote, so I kept quiet. It was sniffing around my neighbor's front yard, when all of a sudden, it stopped dead in its tracks and stared directly at my boyfriend and I. Now this stare made the hair on my neck and my arms stick straight up. It was like it wasn't just looking at me, but studying me almost, when all of a sudden it stood up on two legs and hauled ass into the field behind my neighbor's house. When it stood up, it was very tall and gangly, but it stood up so smoothly, and when it started to run you would think that it was use and bolt. It was so fast, but oddly enough I never heard its feet hit the ground. I grabbed onto Rob, scared out of my damn mind. I turned to him, but he was still watching it run away. I whispered to him, what the fuck was that? His face went pale and he replied to me, hurry and get your ass inside the house. Lock the doors, shut your blinds, turn your lights off and call me. No questions asked. I started to sprint back to the house, into the backyard, to the door, and when I got inside, I did exactly what he said. I got into my bedroom, which is in front of the house, top floor. I peeked out my window, and Rob's car was already out of sight, so he must have burned major rubber to get out of here so quickly. I have never dialed his phone number fast enough. He answered asking if everything was okay, and making sure I was fine and asked if I had did everything he said. I again asked him what we had just seen. He told me he didn't want to freak me out, but eventually he gave up and explained to me what it was. Babe, it was definitely a skinwalker. He continued to tell me that he knew because he had seen one before and was well informed on what they were because of the Navajo friend of his, and he was there that night when he saw one for the first time too. His friend took Rob back to his house, and his grandmother explained to Rob the Navajo stories behind them and what they were, and she also cautioned both of them not to go near them. Don't think about them. Don't 
talk about them, etc. Needless to say, we were both scared out of our minds, and we started to hang out in the city, in his house, rather than where I lived, because it was such a bad experience. Seven years later now, we're married and living in the city. We don't talk about what happened that night, unless it has to be talked about. And when we do, we both get pretty frightened. I will post later about my other encounters, and maybe I will convince my husband to let me put his story on here. Little background first. I was serving 15 year sentence in a penitentiary in southern Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important, but during my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain, and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. Supposedly years ago something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently, about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of these routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off during the check. When a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out, they found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of the other man over him, loosely fitting, draped over him. Apparently looked like a real monster. The scariest thing was, though, was the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. We had no idea how he even got into the prison, let alone a cell. What's worse is they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that, they never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realise that's not a go-to definition of a skinwalker, but that's what the prison called him, the skinwalker. Didn't help that the guy never talked apparently. Anyway, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened, and just about everyone in Gen Pop felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear, to place in your home for the foreseeable future. Now on to the real shit though. Sure, the guy was, the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old life in a vagal in me to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, almost everyone can tell their mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking, but apparently they get better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. Apparently he thought it had a human mannerisms down so well that you might not even be able to tell if you're cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good he posited one night. He wouldn't expect a skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill, but this one realised it had a revolving door of people to kill, and masterfully buried its time as Carol thought for years. A lot of the guys found humour in it, a lot were really on edge about it. Every once in a while in prison people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. The guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during rag time. They would let their hair hang in front of their faces. No one liked to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or just people going crazy. But I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than a couple of weeks before they were shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there was the nighttime occurrences. Sharp, loud bursts of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig's dying squeals 
and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing that no one talked about. Even scarier was the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows flit across my walls on a regular occasion, when there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall and made a perfect silhouette of a person standing there, but when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep and no one was outside my cell. And the footsteps. Everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhumanely fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell, and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed, I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about nine months ago, and I have more stories than I can count. I swear, it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in the same kind of way. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing? I woke up one night to him somehow snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For a reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part though? He was coming back into our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him, just left. He seemed fine with it, so, so was I. I had made it through 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates a free man. As I walked along the fence for the rec yard, I spotted my cellmate, standing off on his own, like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I had. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard was Carl, slouched over, eyeing the other inmates and twitching manically. I went on the deep web before. It was probably early 2018 or 2017. I was in class. I was bored and done with all of my work on the computer. So I decided to find some creepy stuff. I was reading on a haunted doll on a sketchy website. I find a link called the deep web. The deep web is pretty similar to the dark web, but more accessible. The school didn't block it, so they must have just been unaware of this website or not even know how to access it. It was just a website with a whole bunch of links that people have found on the deep web. So the first thing that I see is, how do you hide a body? I looked at the replies and found disgusting and disturbing answers. The one that made me click off of the post was, cut it up and throw it into the ocean. I was pretty scared to see something like that suggested. I had found many crime scene photos having to do with murder. There were many photos that I just wish I never saw. I found many photos of dead bodies, but these weren't like crime scene ones. I saw the person look into the camera crying. I didn't want to see the rest, but I looked down and next to the person was a child. That is when I exited the site. I regretted it. I didn't want to go back, and I consider myself lucky. My friend knew some people that actually went on there, and they are still going to court for this possession of the child you know. I warn you not to go on the deep web, even though this was just a website that had some of the stuff from there. Don't do it. You'll regret it. So I'm a 17-year-old boy living in South Germany, in Hessen to be exact. I'm a German, so I have piss poor English. I lived in a pretty loud neighborhood with some crazy stuff going on. 
I don't care if you believe me or not, but I know what I experienced. So one day at school, my friend, let's call him Jack for privacy reasons, told me about the dark web. Back then, I had absolutely no idea what it was. He said you can order weed and buy illegal stuff from it. I thought that that was the only thing that could be found on the deep web, but I was wrong. My friend invited me over to his place so we could check it out. But I said that we should go to my house first, and so he agreed. So, after school, we did just that. Later on, after meeting up, he told me instructions on how to use the deep web, so I followed him. I downloaded the Tor browser and some free bad VPN. When we had everything, we used a search engine that we found on some random wiki called Ice Rocket, and off we went. Our journey started off with us looking for some weed on sale and some guns, and we were exploring a lot, but of course we didn't buy anything. When we accessed some random site, it was completely blank, and then the pop-ups started showing up. There were lots of links leading to some random sites. So we clicked on a random one, and one site was named something like Child Experiments. I told my friend that this was some deep shit and that we should probably leave the site, but his curiosity got the best of him. He started scrolling down, and there were some pictures of, let's just say, younger people cut up in half, in parts, and in total. I was disgusted as fuck and told him that we needed to leave this immediately, and he didn't. I just regret shutting down the computer, plain and simple. There were some videos. One was named Burning Child. And of course, he went to click it. What I saw next will haunt me for the rest of my life. I can't just explain what I saw. I felt heartbroken. This little kid was struggling and screaming against two men who held him down as the flames licked his body. He was screaming in pain and I could see his skin melting. And I was literally crying. What sicko would do this? Then all of a sudden a chat box appeared and a guy named Fire435 or something said, Hey, you enjoying this? We didn't know what to answer, so he, it just went on to say, Hey, I'm talking to you. Then a live video stream showed up, and it was fucking us. Us being recorded through our webcam, and I didn't know it was on. We panicked and tried shutting down our computer, but it didn't react. And all of a sudden, more messages coming up started saying, Why are you trying to leave? We're just hunting for our next victims. Me and Jack were almost in tears now. And the sicko read our street address, names, age, and literally everything about our personal data. Jack then unplugged the computer and shut it down, and thank God. All of a sudden, Jack's mobile phone. It was a message from an unknown number. It read, I'm going to find you. Jack immediately blocked the number. So we decided to have a short discussion on what to do next. We were worried for our lives. What if this dude found us? But of course, time passed without any experiences, without anything occurring out of the usual, and we eventually forgot about the experience, until there was a delivery for me. It didn't have a name written on it, but I was curious and went on to see what was inside. I wish I never would have opened that box. There I found a picture of a human heart. The box was full of child's body parts. I screamed and dropped the box and immediately called the cops. They investigated and said that if they found further information that they would tell us. After that, everything went back to normal, and I've never heard about that shit again. But I'm pretty damn sure that that guy that we talked to is the one who delivered that package. Sometimes I wonder why this world is so cruel. And for everyone who hasn't been to the dark web yet, I just suggest that you stay out, or your life will be in danger. This happened last year. 
I was damn curious about what was the actual deal on this dark or deep web stuff. So I went on YouTube for a tutorial, just watching to see how to access the dark web using an Android. And I planned on just surfing some of the dark web using my phone. Someone had uploaded a file for Android for the Tor browser. I didn't know what I was really up to, but I was too curious and excited. So everything was set. I downloaded all the files and I set up everything like I was told. I covered my phone screen with tape and then I went to my room and locked it. I opened up this Wikipedia-esque site for deep web links. Everything was cool and I went to those normal happy chat sites. I didn't text in it, obviously. I just observed. So you see, I gained some confidence and opened up this creepy anonymous confession site. I swear, you guys, my faith over humanity vanished after reading some of these confessions on there. Some people commented how they would kill their wife, mom, daughter, neighbor, whatever. Some commented on how they tried to kill someone and failed and how they regret it. Some commented on how they love to watch people suffer. And some graphic things were written over there, which I honestly don't want to write on here, as I'll definitely get blocked after writing them here. Some more mentally ill people started commenting how stupid people are for loving someone and how for not doing bad stuff to them. So I had enough of all this, but I still wasn't done. I wanted to see as much as I can. So yeah, I went and opened a specific community. I'm going to keep that off up here for you guys. Had a whole bunch of chat links. It took a while to load the site. While it was loading, I thought maybe it was all fake. And maybe the site was also fake. But then, boom. I saw the site full of text and sick people. I can say that maybe they were ill or maybe they're just not human. I don't want to explain any of the things from there, as again, I may get blocked. The next thing I did was I went to the site. I don't remember really what the name site was, but I do remember that it was selling things made out of human skin or some organs. Damn, they were costly too. It made me almost puke everything inside of my stomach up. So I closed that site. I now went on to those sites selling guns, drugs, and many other illegal stuff. It was boring for me, so I decided to stop and I closed every freaking thing out and deleted all of the browser app. I tried to sleep, but I just couldn't. I wasn't able to sleep for the next two straight days. Everything felt horrible and ugly. But after four to five days, things went back to normal. I was using WhatsApp, texting my friends, and then I got a notification. Ding ding. Someone texted me on WhatsApp. It was an unknown number. It was an international number. I opened the text not thinking much, and I saw this creepy text. Why are you ignoring me? I got a little tensed, as I don't have a friend from abroad and maybe it was just a scam. I ignored it, and the next day, I got another text from the same number saying, You can't ignore me. I'm still here. You can't run away. I was now damn sure that things got out of hand, and I almost believed that I'm going to die. I quickly blocked the number and told my close friends about what happened about the dark web. One of my friends said the same thing also happened to him, last year after he surfed the dark web. He said that he blocked the numbers, but soon started getting these creepy deadly calls. So he changed his number and his life was good again. So now here I was, a messed up teenager. I was out of breath. I was afraid to tell anybody this, not even my mom and dad, not even saying a single fucking word, but I tried to control it by myself. The next day I got another text on WhatsApp from another unknown international number saying, Why did you block me? You can't do anything now. Now it was very clear that someone just got my fucking number through hacking. I quickly blocked that number and reported it and deleted WhatsApp. 
deactivated all my socials too. After a week, I came back and now everything was cool. But the next week, I got another text from an unknown international number on WhatsApp itself. So yeah, I was not afraid enough. And I decided to not open that chat and blocked it, quickly reporting it as a spam. After that, nothing happened. And I promised and swore to God and myself that I would never ever be going back on there. Even if someone offers me money for surfing the dark web. Nah, I ain't ever going on there again. My life is more important to me. I was around 16 at this time, so I was commencing a new secondary school. During my early days of attending this new educational facility, I met this rather charming guy who I will now refer to as Jacob. Even though Jacob was quite enticing, he seemed to show an unsettling amount of quirkiness. Not the kind of quirkiness that you'd see in those nerdy people who would read Marvel comic books like me, but the quirkiness that will make you think that this particular person could potentially be a serial killer. Being the pushover and overly friendly person, I put that aside and became friends with him. One Saturday afternoon, Jacob invited me to stay at his place. I didn't have anything else to do, so I accepted the invitation. Around 20 minutes later, he picked me up and took me to his place since he was able to drive. Upon arrival to his place, I took a look at the property. It was out in the bush, a big property with a main house which his parents and sisters lived along with his granny's flat around 10 meters from the main house where Jacob lives by himself. I checked my phone for the time. It was around 5 in the evening and I noticed that I had no reception. Which is strange because Telresta, the phone company that I'm with, normally gets really good reception and I can get at least decent signals when I'm out in the bush with my own family. I thought I was in a setting for a classic horror movie, but I humorously brushed it aside and out of my mind. Once we settled into his place and in his kitchen slash living room, he went off to have a shower. As I heard the water being turned on in his bathroom, I thought it would be a good idea to go snooping around. Nothing too privacy invading, just to look at the decor at his place and see what his room was like. In the midst of snooping, I saw various things. His old jersey, when I used to play rugby. A few artworks he did since he's an art student and a photo booth style photo of him and his ex, which I kind of got jealous of because... I kind of had feelings for the guy back then. The creepy part, though, was his room. Upon stepping into his room at first, it does seem normal. Bed with a nightstand, desk with high-tech computer and camera, stuff like that. But as I looked around, a half-opened drawer in his nightstand caught my attention. As I looked in the drawer, I noticed something that sparked up red alarms. A big, sharp butcher knife, rope, BDSM style handcuffs, and a bottle of something that I knew wasn't lube. I tried to brush it off as Jacob, just maybe he was being kind of hella kinky, but something in me knew that something was fishy. Maybe because of the rumors I heard at school about him doing some sort of fucked up shit. And at first I ignored them, but now I started to believe in these rumors. Shortly after discovering this, I heard the shower turn off and I sprinted my ass right back to where I was sitting before the shower began to try to see if I could get reception. He came out of the bathroom, dried and dressed. He made an amusing remark about the reception here and as he walked up to where I was sitting and expectantly hugged me and scooped me into a bridal style, he carried me to his bedroom. These sudden actions made me have kind of a mini anxiety attack and a little bit fearful for my life. As he placed me on his bed, Jacob proceeded to go to his tripod next to his desk and prop his camera on and directly at me. This made my brain say, get the fuck out of here, as my heart was pounding in fear, thinking that this was going to involve possible sexual assault or murder and all of it to be on film for the deep web, since he told me that he visits deep web sites frequently. Luckily in this situation, I was able to be smart enough to escape and so I pretended to read a text for my mom saying that I needed to come home. I lied to him that my mom wants me to come home and said that 
she should pick me up. I apologized for my unforeseen leave and bid him farewell before I rushed out of his property once I got to his granny's flat. As I was about one or two streets away, I called my next door neighbor to come pick me up since I knew that my mom was out of town for the night. Once my friend picked me up, I told her about some story as to why she was here and she should take me home. Ever since that incident, I was scared of Jacob and lessened my time in talking with him. After I graduated, I blocked him on all contacts and never talked to him again. That night was the most fearful night I've ever experienced. After that, don't go to guys' places that live on their own. What's your emergency? Yeah, hi, um, this is gonna sound kind of strange, but there's a man stumbling around in circles in my front yard. Could you repeat that, sir? He looks sick or lost or drunk or something. I just woke up to get a glass of water and heard snow crunching around underneath my front window, so I peeked out. I'm looking at him now. He's about ten yards away from my window. Something's just not right. What's your address, sir? Yeah, it's 1617. In Penella Pass. I'm going to send a squad car your way, but that's quite a ways out. Are you alone in your house, sir? Yes, I'm alone. Can you confirm that all your doors and windows are locked? Stay on the phone with me. Uh, I definitely know that my front door is locked. But I'll go and check my back door again, real quick. I appreciate your help, by the way. I know this is kind of strange, but I really hope that. Sir, are you still there? He's... He's still in the yard. But he's... What the fuck? He, he's upside down. Sir, stay on the phone with me. What's happening? He's staring right at me. But he's... He's standing on his hands now. He's perfectly still, staring straight at me. He's doing a fucking handstand, and he's smiling at me and not moving. I... I don't know how he... Yeah, he's facing me and standing on his hands, and he's got a huge smile, and he's perfectly still. What the fuck? Please get someone out here now. Sir, I need you to remain calm. I put out the call. An officer's on his way. His teeth are... huge. What? Please help me. Sir, I want you to try to keep an eye on him, but make sure your back door is locked again. We need to make sure all possible access points are secured. Can you talk me through and confirm that your back door is locked? Okay. I'm walking backwards now, and keeping him in my sight. My hand is on the back door knob now. It's locked. I need to check the deadbolt, so I'm going to take my eyes off of him for a split second. All right, sir. Help is on the way. Just stay on the phone with me. Everything's going to be all right. Sir, are you still there? He's... his face... It's against the glass. Sir, I need you to speak up. What is happening? I looked away for a split second and now... His face... is pressed up against my front window. His teeth are huge and he's smiling. There's no color in his eyes. Jesus, please help me. Why won't he fucking move? Sir, I need you to go to the nearest room and lock yourself inside of it. Do you have a basement or a bedroom that you can lock yourself in? He won't stop staring. He's going to hurt me. Sir, I need you to listen to me. Lock yourself somewhere safe until the officer arrives at your house. Can you hear me? I... Yes, yes. I'm going to lock myself in the room. And you're positive that you're alone in your house, correct? Yes, I'm alone in the house. Wait a moment. He's moving. He's shaking his head. He's telling me no. He can hear us. He's telling me I'm not alone. 
Sir? Sir, are you still there? I heard a loud noise. Is everything all right? Sir? This is very urgent, so I'll get right to it. I pulled some strength with the colleagues in the department, and I was able to obtain the copy of this police report that the officer filed in regards to the call two weeks ago. I've got to be extremely careful about covering up this officer's personal information. The investigation is ongoing, and there's been some weird stuff happening. You'll see what I mean down below. The police and the news departments are in a frenzy trying to keep the details quiet for now, and there is a palpable feeling of unease circulating around the town. If my boss finds out that I'm posting all this here and I lose my job, so be it. This is only the official statement, if you could say, being released to the public tomorrow morning. Ashland Police Department advises all homes and businesses within a five mile radius of Panella Pass to secure all doors and windows by any extra security measures available, effective immediately. A curfew is in effect for all the citizens in the city of Ashland. All the persons found on the streets after sundown will be held and questioned in regards to the suspicious cult activity. A police barrier has been placed around the perimeter of the quarry in Northwest Ashland. No one is to enter the restricted zone until further notice. And all persons found attempting to enter this restricted zone will be subdued on site. Officers have been ordered to use force at their own discretion. There will be no exceptions. And here is the transcript of the actual police report filed by the officer that arrived on the scene. I don't know how my friend got a copy of this. Honestly, I don't want to know. Beginning report. Officer redacted. Approach the premise of at 4.37 a.m. on February 9th, 2015 in response to a 911 dispatch report of a suspicious person. The officer immediately noted that there were no lights on in the house and there was no response after the officer repetitively knocked on the door while identifying himself. Officer Redacted noticed a series of erratic footprints and handprints in the snow leading up to the house. Officer Redacted noted no evidence of forced entry into the home through the bay window. Upon examining the rear of the house, Officer Redacted noted another set of footprints originating from the edge of the quarry, approximately 20 yards from the house and leading directly towards the back of the house. The prints were spaced extraordinarily apart, indicating that the individual was able to cover an immense amount of ground relatively with a few strides. The officer then noted a series of marks presumed to be handprints and footprints leading directly up to the aluminum siding of the house and ending immediately under the attic window on the third floor. The officer then noted that the attic window appeared to be broken into from the outside. There were no ladders or cables visible which could have assisted an invader into reaching that third story window. Author's note. On the copy of the report that I have, the sergeant of our police department circled the section and wrote in the margin, what the hell? Investigation and verification needed immediately. Upon completion of the officer's survey and his inability to enter the house without a lawful warrant, officer redacted began driving away in his squad car at approximately 4.43 a.m. As he was calling the station, reporting his findings. He claims to have witnessed several pale, smiling faces appearing in every window of that house, each wearing an expression of what he later described as eager and amused curiosity. End of report. As I said, the city issued curfews and information about the restricted zone will be announced tomorrow. But I thought I would alert everyone here first. As far as I know, the exact details of the report are being held in confidentiality because, as you can see, 
there are some unsettling things surrounding this entire incident. Author's note, as I was uploading all of this information, another coworker friend of mine from the emergency dispatch staff called me to inform me that the officer that was called into the scene has gone missing. You will definitely hear about that tomorrow if you live anywhere near this area. Police units from nearby counties are being brought in to assist us with this search. I say this as a dispatcher. Please take these ordinances seriously and report any suspicious findings to any authorities. According to my friend, the officer's wife was the last person to have seen him. Apparently he was leaving their home. He muttered something about wanting to check out that house again. Remember when the deep web stories were a fad? Every week you'd find a new tale of someone going onto the deep web, finding something terrible, and ending up getting attacked for speaking out against it. This story is, uh, let's just say it's a bit similar. The difference is, I still love the deep web. Let me explain. I was a senior in high school at the time, and I was definitely not a popular kid. My friends were the oddities of the school. The few people who dared to defy the norm. It was them who told me about this deep web. A place on the internet where you can be completely unwatched, anonymous, capable of doing whatever you want. Of course, I was intrigued. Most of my friends were just on there to buy drugs or things like that. But I thought a little bit bigger. I wanted to know what happened on the darkest parts of the deep web. Whether or not my friends were telling me the truth when they talked about the horrible fetish sites or assassins you can hire to kill anyone you like. Of course, I wasn't planning on using any of it. I've just never particularly been interested in things. So fetish sites just don't interest me. And there's really nobody I'd like to kill yet. It was just the mystery of it all. It just fascinated me. Going to these sites would be like peering into the side of the world only few have ever seen. Like a wholly new experience. At the time, I was just tired of the monotony of life. I'd get up and do the same thing every single day. Go to school, attend these classes, talk to the same people, go home, play some games, do homework, go to sleep. And then, it'd just repeat the next day. I wondered if other people got tired of that too. Anyway, it took me a while to actually dive into this deep web. As fascinated as I was, I'd been warned of what could possibly happen to me. I read the stories I talked about. Who isn't afraid of being threatened by hackers or stalked by some creep you piss off online? That kind of shit kept me from actually going onto the deep web until the day that I manned up and decided it was time to take a break from this monotony. It was time to delve into this underbelly of the internet. Time to see the world I had only dreamed of. For the first week or so, it was fucking boring. It was just drug sites and stuff where people exposed government secrets or whatever. Nothing as dark as I expected. I don't even do drugs, so that was honestly useless to me, and I wasn't really into politics. There wasn't really much I was into back then, so I was honestly disappointed. The only reason I kept exploring was just my sheer desire to experience the world I thought existed on the dark web. That world was darker than the drug sites. That world had murder, torture, fucked up stuff for fucked up people and all sorts of nasty shit. I eventually got my wish, just when my apathy towards the dark web got to the highest point. I found what I was looking for. The site didn't have a name. I thought it was a broken link for a bit, since it only led me to a black screen. Right before I could click out, however, a chat box opened up on the screen. Someone using the name admin typed in the chat box saying, Congrats, 
You found the worst place on the fucking net. I stared at the screen more amused than afraid. It took a moment for me to type back. Cool. That's all I said. What else was there to say? I'm not here to see the finest torture, P-word. A moment after, the admin replied. Haha, you won in. I hesitated. All those horror stories flooding back into my head. But it was too late to chicken out. This was what I came for. Even if I just clicked out of this first sign of danger. I had to see what was there. I had to break that fucking monotony. I had to know. I hastily typed back, not allowing myself to stop. Yeah, I want to see. The chat box closed and it led me directly to this what looked like a video and another chat box next to it. There were around five other people there, each eagerly waiting for something. The video was black and white and showed a small room. The only thing inside was a wooden chair until, after about five minutes of waiting, the door to the room opened. The man was shoved inside, blindfolded and naked basically, with just a pair of black briefs on. He was followed by a woman. This one was dressed in all black. Her face, face covered by this mask. In an instant, the chat room went wild. I almost closed the window to spare myself knowing immediately where this was going. But again, I told myself that this is what I wanted. Maybe not the torture, but the window into the very worst parts of the world. The woman pulled out a knife in her pocket and cut off the man's blindfold as she shoved him into the chair. He didn't struggle for a moment, and once his eyes were visible, I could see why. It looked like he had been drugged, Resistance was impossible. I frowned and glanced to the side. Okay, this was kind of fucked up. I knew this was fucked up. My conscience told me to call the cops, or at least click out, but I forced myself to watch. She turned to the camera, pointing the knife at this man's throat. One of the people in the chat typed, One of the fingers, cut off one of the fingers. I clenched my hands into a fist, taking in a sharp breath. Was this really fucking happening right now? Was I going to watch somebody get mutilated? As a small crowd of people watched in glee, I felt like I was going to throw up. A feeling that only worsened when the woman nodded and turned to the man, grabbing his limp hand and carefully slicing off one of his fingers. Blood spurted from the wound. The man moaned in pain but he couldn't fight back. Breathing heavily, I hovered my sensor over the X, planning to just get the fuck off of here, but I didn't. The woman looked unimpressed, as if she thought that people in the chat could do better. Another person called out, slice up that man's arm, and she complied. He was bleeding heavily now, clearly in deep pain, but these people, these people were fucking sick. They were cheering her on from the chat, suggesting new and painful tortures for her to inflict. Eventually, I just stopped breathing heavily. I stopped feeling sick. It was starting to grow on me. By the end, the man was on the ground, covered in blood and breathing heavily. I watched this for about half a minute. The people in the chat started to die down now. They'd inflicted enough pain. They had their fun. It seemed like things were wrapping up. Funny, I thought. How it was just over when I was getting into it. I smirked. This was exciting. This was better than any game I could play. Much better than any fucking class I could attend. Better than sitting in a group of fucking nobodies, pretending like I cared for any goddamn second of them. This was the world I wanted to see. This was the darkness. This was the underbelly. This was reality. 
fucking end him. Slit the throat. I typed in the chat for the first time. She nodded one last time, bringing the man to his feet before slowly dragging her blade across his throat, sending more of his blood spurting out. Once it was done, she dropped him, and he fell to the ground, limp. He was dead. The people in the chat started complimenting the torture, talking about how it had been a good time, starting to set a date for the next showing. On screen, the woman left the room, leaving behind the corpse. Of course, I hastily wrote down the date for the next showing. This was going to be part of my life now. I was going to be part of something bigger. I was going to command these people's deaths. What a fucking rush. So yeah, I still love the deep web. I'm in college now, and now I'm even more immersed in this deep web. I've seen some shit that people would freak out just knowing exists. I fucked around every sick sight known to man. I finally broke in this monotony of life. Inspirational, right? How one high schooler defies boredom inherent in his life by discovering his true passion. I love the deep web. It was a chilly evening a few weeks ago when my friend Jason and I found ourselves indulging in the dark corners of the internet for our particular amusement. We would often peruse the dark web, trying to find the strangest things we could in that lawless place. We'd been doing it for years since we first got access to the dark web back in high school when Jason found out about the tour. We'd seen everything from drug sites to snuff sites, but on this particular evening, a peculiar link caught our attention. It was titled, Doolittle's Bazaar. Intrigued, we clicked the link. A digital menagerie showcasing exotic animals of all kinds opened up in front of us. It was obviously run by poachers and boasted a large amount of endangered and rare species. Mesmerized by the bizarre collection, we scrolled through the listings, intrigued by the curiosities on display. It had everything from mundane tropical fish to incredibly rare big cats. We were amazed. Amidst the virtual oddities, a seemingly innocuous pop-up materialized, advertising a dog, claiming that it was unlike any other. This dog is made just for you, it's astonishingly intelligent, capable of comprehending and executing any command, the perfect companion, it read. Its price tag was unusually low for what was being offered, almost too good to be true. Being the animal lover out of the two of us, Jason decided to take the plunge, succumbing to the allure of owning a unique and brilliant canine companion, as well as the possibility of rescuing the creature from the hands of the poachers. They're probably mistreating the poor thing anyway. You know what poachers can be like, I've seen videos online. Besides, no one else in the world will have one like it, he said, as though trying to justify his purchase. I warned him that it was probably a scam but he was determined, as though he'd already made up his mind but was now coming up with the justification. He always got like this whenever it came to animals, always leading with his heart. I know it's risky, I'm not stupid, but what if it's legitimate? What if that poor creature is suffering and I can do something about it now, he said. With the nonchalant click of a button, he entered his payment details and placed the order. A sense of apprehension filled me as he clicked the button and the screen flashed payment processed. I wasn't sure why at the time, I think it was just a general distrust of the dark web. After all, we'd seen a lot of things on there before. Well, said Jason, let's see what happens. Worst case I've just lost some money, best case I've rescued an animal. We carried on searching through random links in the dark web, but at the back of our minds was the excitement to see Jason's new dog, as well as the anxiety as to whether it was even real at all. You could never be too careful on the dark web. Jason went home later that night and the events of the evening gradually faded from our minds. Several weeks passed by with no sign of the dog. There was nothing from the company on the deep web either. We both assumed that it had been a scam and that Jason had just lost his money. I told you so I goaded each time I saw him. A few days after that, an obscure package arrived at my friend's doorstep. 
It was a huge box, larger than anything he'd ever ordered before. You could easily fit a full-length sofa inside and still have room to spare. Strapped to the top was a note. Printed on plain paper with no discerning marks, it read, Your very own unique companion is here. We hope you enjoy it. Below, in the red text were the words, No refunds, no returns. Wasting no time, Jason called me. It's here, the dog from the deep web. It's arrived. The box is massive, but I can hear it moving around inside. He practically shouted down the phone in excitement. Point one to Jason, for always being right. What? Really? Haha. Ha. Okay, okay. You win this one, Mr. Awesome. I responded, amazed that something actually had turned up. I'll swing by after work and meet the new furball. Awesome. See you then, he said in that same excited tone. Then he hung up. I couldn't help a feeling of excitement welling up in my stomach. I wasn't exactly an animal lover myself. I could take or leave them, but I was still excited to see this new dog. As soon as I finished work, I made my way over to his house as quickly as I could, interested to see what made the dog so unique. Knocking on the door, Jason slowly opened it, his head poking out gingerly from behind it. So where is it? I asked, trying to glance over his shoulder. Come on, I want to see it. Yeah, okay come in, Jason said, his voice quivering slightly, a stark contrast to his confident tone over the phone mere hours ago. I made my way into the house, but there was no sign of the creature that had been delivered. It's in the basement, Jason said, again in that shaking voice. Now very confused by what was going on, I followed as he led me to the basement. As soon as he opened the door, I was met with an odd stench, not something I'd ever smelt before. It was a sickly sweet smell with a hint of iron. I couldn't help a feeling of apprehension in my gut as I stared down the staircase into the black abyss. Inside the basement, it was dark. There was a small, old light in the middle of the basement illuminating a small area and casting long shadows across the floor. As I made my way down the smell was much stronger, nearly suffocating me, I could make out sounds too. There's no way I could describe those sounds. They seemed like a low grunting noise but there was a high pitched, pained quality to it. There's no way that sound was made by a dog. As my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I could see a large metal cage in the far corner of the basement. It had thick iron bars and a heavy looking padlock on the gate. The floor was covered in sawdust. The sounds seemed to be emanating from further within. Come here girl Jason beckoned, again a quiver in his voice. My eyes remained fixed on the cage, awaiting the reveal of his peculiar new companion. The creature inside it obeyed his command, moving into the dim light. I had to stifle a scream. There's no way that thing could be a dog. It was hairless, with large, red-looking welts all over its body that were held together with stitches. If I had to describe it, I would say that it appeared as if someone had crudely amalgamated human components to create a macabre imitation of a canine form. It was breathing that same, low grunt with a high-pitched whine, as though its every breath was pained. Its face looked stretched, like the skin was pulled back, almost into a grimace of constant agony. I almost feel sorry for the wretched thing if it wasn't so repulsive. Oh God. I said, not sure of what else to say. All words left me. I know, it's horrible, isn't it? I didn't think this is what they'd send. I was expecting something like a really obedient Doberman or something, but not this thing. Jason said. I could hear the sadness and disappointment in his voice. He almost couldn't bear to look at it either. It looks like it's been so badly mistreated. The poor thing. Can you return it? I asked, still looking at the thing in the cage. That same sense of revulsion filling me. No, there are no returns. I'm stuck with her, Jason said in a frustrated tone. Why don't you just give her to a rescue center or release her into the wild? Or something then? I asked. I can't do that, Jason snapped, almost offended. Look at her. Nobody take her for one, and she doesn't look like she'd survive in the wild on her own. She needs help. I felt so sorry for Jason. He seemed genuinely upset by the creature in the cage that he was now stuck with. He was a compassionate person and I could see that this dilemma about what to do and the need to help was eating away at him inside. Alright, I said, if you're going to keep this thing, we can't just call it that horrible thing. What are you going to call it? Got any ideas? Demon Doggo, Scooby Don't. He thought for a second before saying Lucy. Lucy had been his grandmother's name. She passed away when he was really young. Yeah, I think I want to call her Lucy. In the days following Lucy's arrival, Jason retreated further into his house, isolating himself from friends and social interactions. Whenever we managed to catch a glimpse of him, an uncharacteristic skittishness or edge hung about him, a stark contrast to his usual demeanor. He'd still speak and behave like the Jason we all knew, but he seemed distracted, as though he 
was constantly preoccupied with something. He also started dressing differently, wearing long clothing that covered most of his body regardless of the outside temperature, whereas before he was a shorts and t-shirt kinda guy. Every time I would ask him about Lucy he would respond with something like she's good, yeah, or she's getting there, but he wouldn't go into much detail. You could see it on his face, a look of conflict, as though he wanted to confide something in us but he couldn't bring himself to. In the weeks that followed, Jason had gotten worse. It was rare that anyone could get in contact with him at all. When we did see him he was now a skinny, gaunt imitation of the healthy, happy Jason we knew before. He looked incredibly pale and sickly. He'd also developed an odd limp in his right leg. When we asked him about what was happening to him he would laugh it off, saying that the doctors were investigating. But his expression didn't seem to portray the same feeling. He looked worried, almost scared. On the very rare occasions that he did come out with us, he'd normally only stay for a couple of hours before making some excuse to go back home. We were all worried about him. Unable to ignore the signs of his deteriorating condition, I mustered the courage to check on him. When I arrived at his house I pressed the doorbell, waiting a while for an answer. When none came I knocked on the door, assuming that the bell may not be plugged. As I knocked, the door opened slowly. It was unlocked. This was strange. Jason didn't normally leave his door unlocked. With a sense of unease now stirring in my stomach, I made my way into the house, shouting Jason's name in the hopes that he would hear me. His house exuded an eerie silence, and a deeper sense of foreboding enveloped me as I made my way further into the house. It was empty. There was no sign of anyone there at all. It hadn't been cleaned in what looked like ages either. The sink was overflowing with washing. Up in the bins were at the point of spilling over. I shouted for Jason again. Still no answer. I was beginning to get really worried about him now. Growing increasingly concerned, I combed through the house, my anxiety escalating. Amidst my search, a thick booklet perched atop a cabinet caught my eye. Its appearance suggested recent handling, urging me to inspect it. Picking it up, I turned it over and read the cover. It looked like a manual with a picture of a creature that looked like Lucy on the front. So you own a Sanguisuga Canis, was sprawled in a large font at the top. Perplexed, I flicked through its pages. Sanguisuga Canis was Latin for Bloodhound. The creature my friend had purchased on the dark web was a very rare and old subspecies of canine that subsisted entirely on blood. They were so exceedingly rare because of their metabolism, they could only go six to eight hours between feeds until their bodies began to digest themselves and they starved to death. Horror and dread washed over me as I realized the extent of my friend's situation. I continued searching the house with a more frantic urgency, shouting for Jason, but still receiving no answer. Then from the corner of my eye, I noticed that the basement door was wide open. I could smell that same sickly smell of decay wafting up. It was stronger now, and even more nauseating now that I knew it was due to decaying blood. I could also hear sounds from down there, the same low growl and whine as before, but there was another sound mixed in that I couldn't put my finger on. Tentatively, I ventured into the depths of his basement, terrified as to what I would find there. I couldn't bring myself to shout for Jason. It sounds silly, but the sounds in the basement sent shivers through me, so much so that I was too afraid to utter a sound. As I neared the bottom of the stairs, I poked my head around the corner into the dim gloom. I discovered Jason lying unconscious in the middle of the basement under that light. He was pale, deathly pale. I ran over to him, my fears being pushed to the back of my mind, overpowered by a deep concern from my friend. I rolled him over and tried to wake him but he was completely unresponsive. I checked for a pulse, any sign of breathing, or anything else that would show me that my friend was alive. There was nothing. I shook him again, begging him to wake up. The feeling of devastation was crushing. I was doing my best not to break down but I could feel the hot tears welling up in my eyes. Jason, my best friend, was gone. I was so confused. What had happened? I knew that he was sick but I had no idea he was this far gone. Why hasn't he said anything to me? I pulled him close and hugged him, beginning to cry, as though if I hugged him hard enough it might bring him back. He was cold as ice. He was really gone. Slowly I laid his body back down gently onto the basement floor. As I lowered him, I noticed a piece of paper had dropped from his clenched fist. I turned to pick it up, and as I grabbed it, my eyes perceived something that I'm not sure I'll ever forget. Emerging from Jason's right leg, a grotesque and sinewy appendage, resembling a nightmarish vine, slithered into my line of sight. Its fleshy color clashed starkly against his pallid skin, with a labyrinth of capillaries that seemed to writhe and pulse with pulsating crimson fluid. 
the eerie, almost dance-like undulations propelled the liquid in a disturbing rhythm, leading the eye along the horrifying path into the abyss of Lucy's cage. As if called to action by observation, the tube disconnected from Jason's leg with an audible pop before slowly retracting back into the cage. Then there was a low growl as Lucy made her way forward. She was much larger than the last time I saw her, with red stains around her mouth where the tube was now receding. Her stomach was also distended and bloated, a deep red color compared with the rest of her pale frame. She looked me in the eyes with her cold gaze and let out another, threatening growl. I began to back away, noticing the heavy padlock of the cage door on the floor just beyond Jason. A jolt of fear shot through me. She was loose. Without a second thought, I ran. Fear clenched my heart as I scrambled up the stairs, propelled by sheer survival instinct. Reaching the top, I slammed the door shut and barricaded it with a chair. The door thudded seconds later, as though Lucy had thrown herself at it as hard as she could. The door rattled violently and the chair visibly shook, but it held. She made an awful noise, like a roar, but nothing like I'd heard before, but she couldn't get out. Desperation clouded my mind as I grappled with the dilemma before me. I couldn't let that abomination escape, not now that I knew what it was, but nor could I bear to confront the monstrosity that killed my best friend. I felt an overwhelming sense of entrapment and exhaustion as if the weight of the entire ordeal was crashing down on me. With the main danger now sealed behind the door, the reality of the situation settled in, threatening to drown me in a tidal wave of emotions. The grief I'd felt in the basement when I saw Jason's body, my fear as I realized Lucy was loose and now the dilemma of what to do with her. I made my way over to Jason's couch, needing to sit and try to process this, trying to figure out what I needed to do next. As I sat down, I remembered the piece of paper that had fallen from Jason's hand as I lowered him to the floor, the paper I was picking up, just as I noticed that horrific proboscis. In the ensuing chaos, I'd stuffed it into my pocket, not wanting to lose the last remnant of my friend. Taking it out of my pocket, I smoothed it out. It was a note, addressed to me. It would make sense he'd know that I'd be the one to come looking for him. I began to read the rest of the note. Jason had written the note in his final moments, trying to explain why he'd been so distant and strange lately, and apologizing for how he'd been acting towards me and my friends. He explained that he'd not had any other way to feed Lucy, so he had been using his own blood every eight hours to feed the creature. He knew it was draining him, gradually killing him, but he didn't want her to die. She was a living thing and endangered, he'd said, she deserves to live, but he wasn't sure how much longer he could keep it up. He asked me to forgive him, going on to say that he'd valued our friendship above all else. I placed a note down, tears welling up in my eyes. I sat there for hours, finding myself grappling with the knowledge that the creature's thirst for blood had been what had taken my best friend from me, and if I didn't act it would soon lead to its demise. But my best friend sacrificed his life to keep that thing alive, and if I let it die then he'll have given his life for nothing. I've still not made a decision yet, but I can't hear anything from the basement anymore. I guess there's no harm giving her a bit of mine for the moment, just to keep her alive while I decide. Yeah, just this once. When I was about 13, I lived in a big house that was about a mile removed from civilization, but surrounded by a thick forest. It felt more remote than it really was. There were no sidewalks and no streetlights, so it wasn't really a, you would call it, trick-or-treat friendly place. It was too far for a walk on a winding hilly pitch black road between homes. Most kids from our neighborhood went into a crowded downtown on Halloween. And we were so rarely bothered by any outsiders that many of our neighbors didn't really bother buying candy. A ringing doorbell came as a genuine surprise. It did ring, though, a couple of times, mostly early in the night by neighborhood kids who wanted us to see their costumes before they handed out. We'd hand out our trees and admire their ingenuity, and then lock up and settle in for the night. On this Halloween, we went through the process of turning off lights and making sure everything was secure. It was somewhere between 11 p.m. and midnight, long after trick-or-treating hours. Our cocker spaniel was whining, so we opened the front door to let him out one last time. 
The door swung open, and a full-grown man in a clown costume, complete with a grotesque mask, was standing silently on our porch. The dog saw the enormous clown shoes first, as his head slowly raised to take in the baggy striped pants, the cartoonish necktie, and finally, the hideous face. His haunches slowly lowered, and he peed a giant puddle on the floor. They raced through the house, making sure every door and window was locked. Then they peeped out from behind the living room curtains for several agonizing minutes until the clown turned away and walked into the darkness. I honestly can't remember if they called the police. If I had been in their place, I would have. Why was he here? He was too old for trick-or-treat. He hadn't rung the doorbell. He hadn't knocked. He had just stood on our porch, without a word, staring at the door. We'd only seen him by chance when we let the dog out. What were his plans? He'd arrived on foot, in costume, and never made a sound. We never saw if he had a weapon. Why would he do that? If he were some teenager getting an ill-advised thrill out of just frightening the literal piss out of the locals, would he have been so patient as to wait in utter silence in front of our door that might not be open? He was undoubtedly menacing, but the fact that it was happening on Halloween night introduced a dangerous level of self-doubt to my reactions. Were we overreacting? Is it normal for a man in a clown suit, standing there, staring at your front door, on the off chance that you'll open it during the night? It would be years before I saw a few horror movies in which the unsuspecting family was stalked and tortured by people who arrived unannounced in masks at their home in the dead of night. My experience with the clown added a rich dimension of recognition and horror that I've been much happier without. Those films gave me nightmares for months. In the last winter, long after Halloween, we were returning home from a trip, driving along a dark and utterly desolate country road, when suddenly in the headlights illuminated a man standing in the ditch. He was facing us and waved at us, as if he had been expecting us all along. He had almost cartoonish hair and makeup. He looked like the character Robbie Rotten from Lazy Town. He had a guitar slung across his back. A fucking guitar. And he was dressed in a country western costume. You'd almost think that he was returning home from a gig and his car had broken down. The trouble with that explanation was that there were only soybean fields for miles. No little towns, no bars. We hadn't passed any stranded vehicle and wouldn't pass another car, operational or otherwise, until we got to the next town 20 miles away. Still, that self-doubt kicks in. Was he hitchhiking? Was he signaling for help? No, that's the thing. He was standing in the ditch pointed towards us as if he had known all the time that we were coming, with a wide smile of greeting spread across his heavily made up face and a wave to us as we passed. It was a friendly hello wave, not a call for help. I am absolutely sure of that. There was no urgency in his demeanor at all, in a ditch, in the pitch black night, in a soybean field so far from the middle of nowhere that there were no other cars for miles. It was so unsettling that we sped off because we had a young child in the car to protect. The scene was so bizarre and we began to think we'd hallucinated it. When I got home, I told a friend of mine about it. A news director for a radio station in the area. He quickly sent me a screen cap of a dispatch report. Two motorists advising police of a heavily made up man with a guitar, jumping from a ditch into the road and running at the cars. So apparently we didn't hallucinate. It terrifies me beyond reason to think that not only do people wander into the darkness like this 
and no one knows their true intentions, or whether or not they're harmless. But there are apparently so many of them out there, that one person, me, has had two late night run-ins. Who else is out there? What are their plans? Do they rely on Halloween second guessing to take advantage of our split second indecisions? The poor Cocker Spaniel, the one who urinated helplessly all over the floor, remained ardent for the rest of his life. Ronald Clark O'Brien was executed in the US after killing his eight-year-old son, Timothy, by poisoning his candy with cyanide on Halloween night in 1974. O'Brien let his two children and Timothy's friend have a piece of candy before bed. It was one of those pixie stick things with the beads of sugar inside of the packet. But what was once the innocent piece of candy turned into the death of a young boy. The father from Pasadena, Texas, had taken out a huge life insurance policy on his two children. He gave the poison candy to his son and his daughter, but also to four other children. Only Timothy ingested the candy and died. O'Brien was executed in March of 1984. I'm sure you've all heard the legend of the Candyman. The legend goes, if you chant Candyman five times while looking into a mirror, he will appear covered in blood and bees with a sharp hook made for murder. Well, when news of this headline broke, everyone started calling O'Brien the real life Candyman. This true story is a friend of mine named Alex. Last Halloween, my friend had a huge Halloween party and all of our friends were invited. I came early to help her with all the decorations and getting all the snacks and refreshments ready. Around 5.30, we heard a knock at the door. But we weren't expecting anyone yet because the party wasn't really starting until 8. I told her I would get the door while she finished taping up all of these black and purple and orange streamers. When I came to the door, I could see through the little window, the door you know, the window that was fixed on the door. I can't remember what it's called. You can see the person on the other side, but it's blurry, so nobody can peek at you. That's what they had and I could only see the silhouette of a tall person. I knew it couldn't have been any of our friends because none of them were really that tall. So I opened the door assuming that it was a parent or someone selling something. I was met with a really tall male who I quickly recognized as my friend's neighbor. Uh, can I help you? I asked him. He stared at me for a little longer than I would have liked before he replied with his own question. Are your parents home? His voice was deep and it reminded me of gravel. It was common sense that you never tell anyone that you're the only one home. But I guess at the time I wasn't really thinking. No, they're not home right now. I told him. Will they be back later? He asked. I nodded even though it was a lie. They wouldn't be back until Monday. After that he left and I shut the door, walking back into the living room where my friend was. Who was that? She asked me. Your neighbor. He's so creepy. He's always watching us through his window, she told me. What? Seriously? I asked her, not believing it. Yeah, I was outside the other day swimming, and I looked up and saw him staring at me like a freak. Duh, yeah, that's pretty freaking creepy. So we had the party and all that stuff. I was staying over at my friend's house for the whole weekend while her parents were gone. The next day around nine or so in the morning, we heard another knock on the door. I went to the bathroom while she went to open the door. When I was finished in the bathroom, I walked downstairs to see my friend sitting on the couch with two police officers. Apparently my friend's neighbor had done something, assaulted someone, one of the people that came to our party, 
and now he was missing. They were questioning everyone who came to the party to try to find out where he was. To this day, I still don't know where he is or what happened to him. I don't know if the police ever found him after I moved from Sweden, but I know that the girl that he assaulted is going to be scared forever. At the time this story takes place, I was 14, almost 15, and a sophomore in high school. I've never had a paranormal encounter in my life, but I still somewhat believed in the paranormal. This is the first encounter I ever had in my life. In case you don't know what a skinwalker is, they're people that can morph into an animal of their choice and originate from Navajo legends. I'll go further in depth of why I think this encounter was a skinwalker later in the story. So I was at my cousin's house with both of my stepbrothers, and all of us were really into Nerf guns at the time. I'll refer to my cousin as T, my older stepbrother as J, and my younger as A. For our entertainment, we decided to split up into two teams and have what we call a Nerf war. Very creative, I know. The goal of the game was to knock down both of our opponents by hitting them once with a Nerf bullet, as it was pretty difficult to accomplish. Once one person had been shot, they were out of the game and not able to be revived. And once both of them had been shot, the game had been won by the other team. Simple enough. The boundaries were a couple of blocks long, which included a nearby park that we liked to stay at and hide from the other team. Because it was getting dark and we had to leave my cousin's house soon, we decided to have another quick round. We watched as T and A ran into the direction of a nearby ditch. So J and I decided to run towards the park, which was behind us. We ran for a couple of minutes until we reached the huge fake rock that had a slide on top of it, and we decided to camp up there. For a few minutes we sat there, waiting to see if they would try and sneak up on us, because they knew that we would be in that park. Jay and I noticed that there was a dog next to the jungle gym, walking around aimlessly, and we thought maybe it was T's Chihuahua. However, we heard somebody call its name, and realized that there was a guy standing there in the nearby garden. Naturally, we didn't think much of it, except that it was a little creepy that he was just standing there. I tried to rationalize and told Jay that he was probably just watering the plants, despite the fact that he obviously wasn't. Before we could realize, the man was gone, but again we thought nothing of it. Out in the field next to the park, I spotted two figures lying down next to a hill, T and A. Jay and I split up. I hid behind a row of bongos, and he hid behind the nearest rock. After a few moments of silence between us, I told him that we should move into a nearby brush and stalk them from afar, but he refused to. Out of nowhere, we heard a loud screeching coming from the nearby brush. We thought it was some type of bird specifically like an eagle sound or something. But I also suspected that it could have been a coyote. A few moments later, I was looking and admiring the sky when I noticed a shooting star, which I initially thought was a plane. I'm not sure whether if it's a significance to the story, but you'll find out why I think it might later. From that point on, we both had a very strange feeling that we were being watched by someone or something. I had a very weird tingling sensation that was starting at my feet and went up to my chest. It happened multiple times, and Jay said that he had a burning chest feeling, that there was a pain that lasted for a long while, to the point where he could barely run. 
after we left our spot and were going back to the route to T's house, we heard a screech again, but it sounded like it came from where we were hiding. Ultimately, we won the match, but our parents were looking for us and we had to leave his house. T decided to spend the night at our house and as we were waiting for him in the car, A had asked us if we had heard the screech. We started to discuss what we had thought it was, and we all had agreed that it was some kind of eagle. However, after discussing it with T, he told us what he had encountered. When they were in the field stalking us, T said that he heard the screech right in his ear, which is nowhere near where we were. After that, he said that he felt like someone was behind him, and he turned to see what was bothering him. Right as he did, he said that he was drawn to the same shooting star we saw. After we had left the park, which they weren't aware of, they said they both heard Jay's voice calling desperately out to A, his brother. Thinking he might have been hurt or something, T decided that he should go help but something just felt off. They ultimately decided to go back to the house. Looking back, we learned why if they didn't make that decision, they would have been as good as dead. T said that he had the exact same feeling as we did while making his way back to the house. Because I was a very big horror stories fan and heard a lot about these skinwalkers, I asked them if they had thought it could possibly be one but nobody really thought so. I decided to do some research, and we all realized that a skinwalker fits in a situation perfectly, like this. First of all, an eagle is one of the most common forms of a skinwalker, which would explain how we all thought that the screech came from an eagle. Secondly, both teams had heard the screech at different locations, and skinwalkers are known to move extremely quick. Third, they can morph into familiar faces and also imitate voices, which would explain how they heard Jay's voice calling out after we left the park. Lastly, they can actually dig through your mind and know what your fears are. And T was always afraid of people getting hurt while we were playing. That night we were all extremely scared because of the videos and the stories we watched about skinwalkers. However, the final piece of the puzzle was when I woke up to A standing in the doorway, crying. Our dog had died the night before in her sleep. According to one of many sources I found, I read that some skinwalkers are able to poison the loved ones of the victims after an encounter. What do you guys think? Do you think what I encountered was an actual skinwalker, or was it a huge coincidence? I have a couple of stories, one from my mother and one from me. My mother's is probably the most creepiest and has always stuck with me especially with all of the paranormal stuff she has seen. My mom worked a night shift at the hospital in Arizona in a town by the border and go figure, old mining town. Well, anyways, she's working her night shift going room to room when an old lady who walked the halls due to insomnia told her some weird goat man kept trying to get in through the doors. My mom didn't think anything of it, but she is a Catholic and had those moments of silently praying to herself. After a few moments, there was a shriek. She couldn't explain it, but that it was a horrible shriek that made your blood turn into ice. She then went to the nurse's station to ask if anyone else heard that, in which they did. Come to realize, that the shriek was heard all around the hospital, freaking everyone out, especially paranormal religious ladies and men. 
A few of them go to look out of the windows and see hoof marks on the doors and windows. And the marks had no trail towards or away from the building. My story was pretty creepy too. I too became a CNA and worked at a lockdown dementia and Alzheimer's unit at night. I've had creepy moments, but this one will stick with me. I was finishing up my binders when a light goes off in the hall. So I took it, punched my coat in, and went out since the other CNA was busy with someone else. I go in and ask if everything is okay. Sleepily, my little lady tells me that there's a darn woman who keeps knocking on her window, wanting to come in, and that she really wants to just go back to sleep. She insists I go and let her in, and I'm thinking to myself, oh no, this sounds all too familiar. I reassure her, peeking out the window, nothing was there. Maybe she was just dreaming and really tired and mistook it as her roommate. After that incident, I head back into my unit, sit, eat a snack, chat with my head nurse, talk with my usual insomniacs. Mind you, this is around 3ish AM. The light goes off and in my unit. Also, this unit has no outbound lines at all. I head down to her hall and ask if everything was all right. My lady says that she can't sleep. Someone keeps banging on her window and that she is scared. I pretty much about crap myself at this point. I again reassured my lady, thinking what just happened. I tell my nurse and she laughs and said that this has been happening for years. We bought a 50s bungalow a few years ago. The original owner had passed away and we were the first people to live in it since. My daughter's bedroom was on the far side of the house from mine and was always colder than the rest of the house. We chalked it up to just poor insulation in that room. Every night I would hear her talking to someone. Just thought it was a baby sleep babbling. She was about two at the time. Then she started talking to someone in the daytime too. I asked her about it. She told me that it was the blue-faced mommy. The mommy wanted to play peekaboo with her all the time and wouldn't leave her alone. She said she would wake up in the middle of the night to play peekaboo. It honestly freaked me out. I talked about it with one of the older ladies in the neighborhood who knew the original family. Apparently their oldest daughter had suffocated herself in that house after giving birth to a stillborn child. Not sure how she suffocated herself. The neighbor didn't have a lot of details and it happened in the early 70s. I am certain that she was the blue-faced mommy my daughter was talking about. A friend told me she had read about the best way to deal with these lingering spirits was to politely ask them to leave. So one night, when my girl was woken up, I went to her room and politely said, Please, ma'am, your family has moved away. We need you to go now. And after that, nothing. I still get chills thinking about it. A few years ago, I asked my SO if he had ever seen a ghost. He got really uncomfortable and squirrely. Lots of hemming and hawing. Annoyed, I just said, just say yes or no. I won't judge you if you think you have seen a ghost. I'm a skeptic, and I figured that he just didn't want to sound rude or something. Turns out he was hesitant because he believes that he did see one. But it was while he was deployed on a mission in Middle East 
and he was trying to think of how to really describe it without giving up any classified info. The story is this. It was in a spooky, vague Middle East when there was commotion from the soldiers watching the perimeter. Apparently, they could see a man about 100 yards away from the camp. He had appeared out of nowhere. No one saw him walking up. The man just standing there, not doing anything threatening. But since it was strange, a man in the middle of a war zone, they broke out all of their high-tech gear, if you could say, to see what was going on. They could see his face, his clothes, his height, but he looked bizarrely distorted and was given off a weird heat signature. They have infrared jimmy jams and whatnot. It's the freaking military, not a piddling ghost hunting trope. He was not the temperature of a human being. It was the temperature of the air around him. They had no idea what was going on and people were freaking out. At this point, I said some obvious stuff. Maybe it was a scarecrow or a dummy or a shadow, but the soldiers were just really tired and delirious and their eyes were just playing tricks on them. Or maybe it was just a hologram weapon shaped like a human. His response, they called different people up to look at this man. It wasn't just a few soldiers who saw this. Dozens of people came to look and everyone confirmed that it definitely was a person. Eventually, they decided to send out a team to go check this guy out. When they got to about 50 yards away, the man started walking. Only, it didn't look like he was walking toward or away. Only walking in place. They froze expecting an attack, but the man never got any closer. Me. So he was, uh, moonwalking? Oh, a terrorist with some dance moves, so scary. His shaky response. It looked like it was trying to walk, but instead of moving like a regular person, its bones were breaking and splintering backwards and forwards at the joints. I can't think of a better way to describe this. Its head was jerking around like a puppet. When the convoy got a few yards closer, it disappeared entirely. The team hauled ass back to camp. As soon as they returned, the man thing reappeared in its spot. Everyone took turns watching it for an hour until it disappeared for good. Didn't walk away, didn't fly or melt or explode. Just stood there for a long, long time. And then it vanished. Before moving to the United Kingdom in London, I lived in a small Eastern European country which had fair share in violence, war, and misery in its history. Ever since I was young, I lived with my little cousin and my grandmother because of work-related circumstances. My mom was abroad. We have moved a lot when I was young. I lived a peaceful life as long as I could remember at least until we moved to the suburbs, a few miles from a small city. We lived on a farm, secluded with at least a mile until the nearest houses. As the farm was very large, we had around four dogs at the time, which were always outside. Around 800 meters from our house, there was a very big old abandoned barn, which I recently found out was around 50 to 60 years ago. It had a family living there. The husband hung himself after shooting his wife and kids with no apparent reason. Ever since, anyone who walks past that house can tell that they feel like they're being watched or followed the whole time. Me and my cousin went to kindergarten and school for a few years, meaning we had to pass the house every day and to this day, we remember how scary it was to just pass this abandoned house, even though at the time, 
we didn't know its history, only that no one lived there for a very long time. One night I was getting ready to sleep. The moon was very bright with a clear blue sky. I stared through the window from which I could see the old house. To my surprise at the very top, from this tiny window, there was some sort of what looked like a candle lit. I got scared as no one lived there, and the house itself was old and scary for me and my cousin at the time. Actually, frankly, to any farmer around, it was. So that night I went to sleep. As a couple more nights passed, I was lying in bed and I couldn't fall asleep, just staring through my window from my bed. It was bright as the moon was full, and to this day I can't explain what happened that night and what I saw. While staring through the window, I saw three dark figures, like with hunchback or leaning forward quite a lot, not walking, but floating past my window. You can tell when someone is walking, as from their movement, but this was literal floating past my window. And the scariest part, that not only we lived miles away from other farmers, and it was late at night, but though we have four dogs outside who not barked one single time. I got stone cold and my heart dropped as I hid under the covers. I was scared to see that again, so I haven't looked through that window for weeks. After what happened, I told my grandmother and my mom years later. Both of them believed me and only then my grandmother told me what happened at that old barn. I will never forget it, as it is stuck deep inside. At that time, I was around eight to nine years old. But this is the most memorable thing from my childhood. My family is originally from Mexico. This all happened in my paternal grandparents' apartment in the early to mid-1970s. When I was about one or two, my parents moved in with my grandparents temporarily. They had put my crib in my grandparents' room, and my parents stayed in a smaller room. While I don't remember this, my parents told me that I would scream at the top of my lungs whenever I was put down for a nap or for bedtime. They said I would point to the corner of the room and yelled out the words, La Cha Cha. And no, it has nothing to do with the dance. In Spanish, Cha Cha is short for Muchacha, which means young woman. They said this would also occur in the bathroom. I would point at something in the corner and yell La Cha Cha, and then would kick and scream saying that she was going to get me. My cousin also had an experience except she was a little older and ran out of my grandparents' bedroom once. When my uncle, her father, asked what was going on, she said that the man wouldn't let her go to sleep. My uncle, fearing that an intruder had broken in, checked everywhere. They were on the eighth floor, and the window was small with no balcony, so there was no way that anyone would be able to climb and just break in. He asked her where the man was, and she said in the corner, no one was there. The next day, she also ran out crying, saying the man wouldn't let her sleep again. My uncle had had it by then. They then didn't stay there for a long time. My grandmother had hung her laundry on the roof. This is very common in the large apartments in Mexico. And around dusk, it started raining. She asked my aunt, her daughter, to run up and get the clothes because she was making dinner. My aunt, who was about 15 at the time, ran up there and started taking the clothes down. She was by herself up there. Then she said she took down one of the sheets. And when she did, she saw something standing a few feet away from her. Since it was kind of dark and raining and the roof was not well lit, she assumed that it was another tenant so she said hello. The person was wearing a black cloak 
and had its back to her. The minute she said hello, the figure turned around and she froze. She said the hood was empty, except for two glowing red eyes staring at her. She dropped the laundry and closed her eyes, and when she opened them, the figure was gone. She then ran back down the stairs to the apartment in tears and all hysterical. It took a long time for my grandma to calm her down. At first she thought someone had tried to attack her, but then my aunt told her what happened. Apparently other tenants had reported seeing a familiar figure roaming the stairwells and the roof. Whether this thing is related to Cha-Cha or the man who wouldn't let my cousin sleep, I don't know. All I know is that this place was really creepy. And I was finally glad when we moved away to another building. This apartment building was destroyed in a big earthquake in 1985. So it was a blessing they weren't still living there at the time. This experience didn't happen to me, but it occurred while I was around. This happened probably around the mid-90s. My parents, me, and my brother and sister went to Mexico to visit my father's parents. Author's note. This happened to my older brother, by the way. It was a small town or village in Mexico, I don't remember, called Guanajuato, or something pronounced that way. Well, my grandparents allowed us to sleep in my aunt's old bedroom while they slept in a tiny room in the porch. My brother recalls waking up in the middle of the night and there was a black figure sitting in the rocking chair. We slept on the bed together, my brothers and me, and my brother told me that he was scared senseless. The black figure sat there, he described it, with hand on chin, just staring into the darkness on my grandmother's old rocking chair. He then called out to the figure, hey, and it just turned to him quickly, and all he could do was close his eyes and hope that it would go away. He was seriously scared and promised me that this did happen. Then he opened his eyes again and looked around and the figure was gone seconds after he witnessed it. Just gone, with no noise, no doors opening, and no footsteps. It just vanished. He still gets chills whenever he speaks about it. When I get the chance, I talk to him about this black figure in the shadows sitting on my grandmother's rocking chair, staring into nothing, and ask him, maybe it was this, and maybe it was that. Grandma happened to walk into the room, or Grandpa was just checking on us, maybe. I'm hoping that that's all that it was. But he continues to deny it. I still believe him, and I feel saddened for him to experience that, and all because everyone denies his belief but me. He asked my grandma and grandpa and my dad about it, and I think they have yet to witness a figure sitting in the shadows. It still gives me creeps just thinking about that thing in the rocking chair, staring into nothing. Okay, so a lot of weird stuff has been happening recently at my grandparents' house. To start off with, I stay there a lot. I'm only 15, so when your parents can't get their stuff together, you have to stay somewhere else. I'm gonna try to keep this story short, because like I said, this all happened recently. Anyways, let's get to what happened. It started with me and my sister. We went down to go fish at a creek behind their house. Mind you, they live in the middle of nowhere. This is all in New Market, Alabama. So if you want to look up this place, because you might think that I'm lying or something, when I say it's in the middle of nowhere, it's in the middle of nowhere. Back to the story. 
when me and my sister, who's younger than me, were walking the trail back to my grandparents' house, my sister started acting weird. When I asked her why she was acting so paranoid, she said that she thinks someone is watching us. She pointed behind us to the tree line, and sure enough, see a tall, creepy man looking at us between the trees, watching us with his hands on his knees. I am a guy, but even this sort of freaked me out a little bit. It took me back to when my parents would talk about this new market cult that terrorized them when they were kids. They both lived within a mile of each other at the time. Me and my sister got back to my grandparents' house pretty safe. Sadly, this wasn't the only thing that happened. It only got worse. This next thing I actually got on video. If y'all know how to post snaps on Reddit or something, please tell me, because the only reason I got this app is to tell the story. I still remember I looked at the clock and it was exactly 3.34 a.m. I was talking to my friends on the PlayStation. The room I was in was in the back of the house, closest to the cold. I was home alone and pretty tired at the time. If anyone lives near me, then you know how foggy it was, Easter morning. I actually didn't hear the sound at first. I have soundproof headphones, so it was my friends that I heard, and they heard it. They told me to video it, so I walked outside and did. The sound almost sounded like a wounded cow. I would say that it was a cow, but the problem is that first off, the cows aren't allowed at night, and two, the cows weren't even living there at the time. They take them to a different farm every couple of months so they can try and eat fresh grass. The scariest thing about it was the noise kept getting closer. So close in fact that at one point, it was in my grandparents' backyard. It even got as bad as me waking up to scratching noises at roughly 4 a.m. I don't get scared very often, but this was terrifying. Nothing has happened since, but I'll update if there's something. If I figure out how to post that snap too, I will. Update 5-9 Okay, this might be a little bit confusing for y'all, but I'll try my best to explain. The story was originally posted a few days ago, but they don't allow updates. Considering this is, believe it or not, 100% true, I needed a place that allows this feature. So I copied and pasted the story above here. Anyways, I was looking for this cult last night, and it wasn't very hard to find them. The reason I went out at night was because I had a baseball practice after school, and by the time I got home, the sun was going down. I invited Greg over, and we went together. I'm not a weak guy, I'm pretty athletic, but Greg's just big. He's already six foot three, and he's only 14 years old. Me and him grabbed our knives, and walked along the New Market Road. It isn't a long walk, just a few houses down. We reached a dirt road and headed down that. The road leads into different pastures, fields, and ponds. It's really relaxing, almost to the point that you forget what's really out there. It's a long walk down the steep hill that leads to a flat pasture. The dirt road then leads along a creek and connects to the Flint River. We walked along this creek for about an hour and didn't see anything. The only thing that kept us from leaving was the sinking feeling of being watched. It may have just been my paranoia, but I swore that someone was watching us ever since we stepped onto that dirt road. Everything was pretty chill until we reached this tree line. This tree line was really thick and almost impossible to walk through, if you wanted to, due to the thorn brushes. I remember a story that my mother told me when I was little, about how she used to pick the rose from the thorn bush. She was seven then. A man jumped out of the thorn bush and chased her back home. No one believed her when she told her parents. I wondered if the same bush was in front of me. Around that time, everything got real quiet. 
The birds, frogs, crickets, and even the animals stopped making noise. I remember how me and Greg stopped talking and looked at each other. I could tell that he was scared, but tried to hold it. It was like fear was just there, like our instincts told us to run away. We were looking at each other, and when we heard the snap in the woods, we spun our heads to see a tall man with a deer skull over his face. The world slowed down, and my mind raced a thousand thoughts per minute. The man was right behind us and had one hand on a little tree, pulling himself around to see us clearly. A scream jolted us from our trance, and we ran for the hills. After the scream, the bushes started moving, but we didn't stick around to see what came out. It probably took us about five minutes to run an hour-long walk. I couldn't feel anything but the tingling of my adrenaline as I raced along the side of Greg for my life. We stopped at an abandoned dry cleaners and sat in the parking lot, asking ourselves what to do. Greg had tears in his eyes, and I was a bit shook also. We debated whether we should call the cops or keep it to ourselves. I told him not to, but he called the cops anyways. They only searched the grounds for about 15 minutes. The only thing they were able to find were ashes from a fire in the woods, but put it off as campers. They acted like they did, but I could tell they didn't buy our story. Greg went back to his house, and I went back to mine. That was yesterday. Tonight I'm home alone, and really not looking forward to it. If this cold comes for me, I've got a shotgun waiting for them. I know this sounds bad, but if they break in or threaten me in any way, I will shoot them. Update 5-9 Sorry it took me so long to update this. The reason I pasted the original story without the updated part is because I had a class and stuff. If you want to see the Snapchat video, it's on my profile now. If anyone has any similar experience or maybe even has information on the New Market cult, then please tell me. Oh, and I don't know if everyone calls it the New Market cult. My family calls it that, so that's just stuck with me. If I don't respond, then the worst has happened. But don't worry about me. I like a good adventure. Update 5-9 I feel kind of sick right now. I was replying to your comments when my mom called me. I answered, of course, because I'm home alone, like most nights, and I wonder why she's calling me. I mean, my mom doesn't even know how to show up to my games or take care of me. Why would she call? I mean, she took care of me at one point, but dad made her snap one day. But that's besides the point. Anyways, I ate this call from my mom, and I answered it. I of course said, hello, but all I heard was breathing. I kept asking if she could hear me, but just more breathing. I figured that Verizon did some stupid glitch, where you can hear them but they can't hear you. I hung up the phone and called her back. For once she picked up her phone and asked, what's up? I asked her why she called me, but she said that she hadn't. I figured she was pulling a prank on me, and I hung up. Not too long after, she pulled into the driveway and said that I had a package. It had my name on it. She drove off and I ripped open the package and threw the cardboard box into the burn pile. I unraveled this bubble wrap to find another box, a wooden one. This box was long and skinny, and when I saw it, it automatically gave me the creeps. I hesitantly opened it, and there was a bunch of hay. Under the hay was a long ass scary looking knife. I don't know if someone had pulled a prank on me, but if so, it's not funny, because the knife's rusted and not normal looking. It's got a snake handle, and the blade is swirling. I'll take a picture and post it on my profile. 
If anyone has seen a knife before that looks like this, please tell me and be honest. And no, I didn't touch the knife with my hands. I have gloves. Update. 510. Last night nothing happened, thank God. Except for the weird package I got in the mail. The only thing other than that that had set me off were the footprints circling the house. They stopped at every window. The prints seemed to turn towards whatever window they were in front of. Yesterday it rained really bad, so it was pretty muddy. I've just got done with my work in class, and I'm wondering if any of these kids, or even my teacher, are a part of this cult that's been stalking me. It would make sense because whoever it is that runs this cult knows where I live, my mom's number, my first and last name. Update 510. First, I'm going to state that we're talking about moving, like fast, maybe within a month or so, but there's no telling. The reason for that is because it's getting very bad. Okay, I wasn't home alone this time because I told my mom about everything that had happened. When my grandparents had to leave to help out with the food drive again, she actually stayed with me. She wasn't herself though. She was acting really quiet and paranoid. She would stop and look out of the blinds every few seconds and always had a straight face. She freaked me out more than the fact that there was a cold behind the fucking house. She didn't say anything and honestly I didn't either because she freaked me out. It wasn't until I asked her what was wrong that she finally said something. She told me that when she was a kid, the same thing had happened to her. People would show up in the middle of the night, watching through her window. Every time she told her parents, they would get death threats in the forms of letters and weird objects. The letters had personal information that only could be known by people that were stalking. I was really surprised by this, but didn't get the chance to speak on it because the song started playing outside. I knew the song. It's called Day of Chaos. I used to listen to it whenever I would take out the trash at night to make things more exciting. The song was getting closer and it wasn't any type of song you would want to hear at night. My mom jumped up and grabbed the shotgun and I grabbed my baseball bat. I would record it, but my phone was on the back porch and there was no way I was going out there. We shut the lights off and sat in the kitchen looking at each other. To be honest, it was the scariest experience of my life. My heart dropped because I heard a creaking noise in the garage that's connected to our kitchen. The music followed with it until it was at the door which separated us from the garage. My mom pointed the gun at the door and leaned her back against the wall. Her face was straight and determined. I'm sure mine wasn't. The silence went on for about a solid hour. Neither of us moved, and I could see the gun in my mom's hand starting to shake. She kept glancing at the window above the sink. I did too most of the time, but my eyes were on the door. All of a sudden I felt the world stop, or at least I thought I did. The music stopped playing, and the fear dropped a little bit. My mind wasn't as clogged up anymore without the music, and I started thinking. My stupid ass then remembered about the back room window. It was open. I screamed to get out of the house, and my mom didn't hesitate to jump up and book it for that door. It was all kind of a blur at that point because swiftly swung open that door and dove through that car window. It wasn't as cool as it sounds because it did hurt, but it might have saved me. My mom swung around the other side of the car and got into the driver's seat, slamming the door. We tore it out of the driveway, but of course, I had to look at the house on my way out. I know this next part may sound a little bit made up, but I swear it's true. I looked at the house 
and saw the tall man with the deer skull on his face standing on the fucking roof. A shorter man with a hood over his face pulled another man out of the fucking chimney. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life, and no one will ever believe me and my mom. I also saw another hooded man peering at us through the back door window in the house. I saw all of this in a blur. There could have been more, but I didn't care. We're still driving now, and I don't know where we are going, but we are going somewhere, somewhere safe. I hope this is the end of my story. If I make another update, it's probably not going to be pretty. If anyone wants to check this out, feel free. I don't care. If anyone wants to read this, please do. It needs to be known. Just leave me out of it. Private message me if you're willing to look for these people. I offered to call the cops, but my mom said that they tried this when she was a kid. They always come back for you if you call the cops, and the cops might even be in on it. I will reply to the comments best I can for anyone that has questions. Just don't ask me to go back there because I'm not doing it. Now before you leave the video, I wanted to say thanks for watching, I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did like it and you would like to hear more of these, make sure to comment down in the comment section. Make sure to like, comment, and if you're new to this channel and you do like what you hear, make sure to subscribe. We're doing nothing but growing. If you would also like to, check out the links in the description, my Twitter, Instagram, and even my Gmail if you want to submit a story or in there. But other than that, stay safe, stay scary, and I'll see you in the next one. Make sure to check out for the next video. I promise it's going to be pretty fucking cool. Okay, love you, bye.